great. Thanks, Megan. Okay. Um, so thanks very much to, you know, the PSI and BPS for organising this event, which I'm sure is going to be just incredibly helpful for, for everybody attending. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about a career in applied behaviour analysis. And my name is Michelle Kelly. I'm a board certified behaviour analyst. Um, I'm a lecturer in psychology in the National College of Ireland. And I'm also the chair of the Division of Behaviour Analysis. Okay, so first of all, what is applied behaviour analysis? Well, what applied behaviour analysis really is, is I guess in, in very simplistic terms, is it's a science where we will apply the principles of behaviour to try to improve um, a, a, both behavioural and academic outcomes. So really we focus on socially significant behaviour and we focus on looking at contextual and environmental factors that can improve outcomes for people and um, who, need, who need it most. So, you know, we focus on things like positive reinforcement. So, you know, um, we have a strong focus on operant conditions, as you can see denoted by uh, Skinner's rat here in my picture, who will press his lever for food and um, for positive reinforcement. So I'm sure people are familiar with some of that terminology from, you know, from your um, behaviour modules in your, your undergraduate degree in psychology. So it's an extension of, you know, the principles of behaviour and operant conditioning, and then how do we apply this in an applied setting? So just to expand on that a little bit further then, um, this picture that you see up on the screen, this would be quite a common scene um, in a, a, a setting that would be using applied behaviour analysis. So typically, um, behavior analysts would work with people. Uh, well, you can work with people on a one-to-one -one or in a group basis, but typically you would work with somebody on a one-to-one -one basis. You're pro providing a intensive intervention and you're providing intervention for individuals who need additional support in obtaining skills, um, obtaining you know, maybe language skills, communication skills, and, and different kinds of learning, um, learning goals. So ABA is guided by the attitudes and methods of scientific inquiry. So, you know, there's hundreds, thousands of applied and experimental studies that are published in behaviour analysis over the years that demonstrate these scientific methods of ABA. Um, if you're the kind of person who likes everything being very systematic and everything has to be, you know, explained and there has to be a procedure in place for everything, you like things to be quite technological, then ABA might be a career to consider. Um, because it definitely is the kind of work where everything is implemented in a very systematic way. So, you know, on the basis of, of science, we need to look at operational definitions of behaviour. We need to look at why behaviour occurs in certain contexts and certain settings. You know, what are the contexts that can improve learning outcomes to the maximum degree? And then we use data then to guide decisions. So we will take data on you know, why a behaviour occurs, when the behaviour occurs, and how, what sorts of, of contextual variables can influence whether the behaviour will increase or decrease in the future. This data then guides our, de our decisions on how we would manage the, the behaviour in the future. So lots of data, lots of systematic application, uh, lots of technology. So not all means of changing behaviour then qualify as ADA. So it would only be the, the the basic principles of behaviour and use those basic principles to derive interventions to, to change behaviour or to improve behaviours. So these are kind of from a from I guess a basic point of view, the way that we we would we would work within ABA. So it's all around focusing on um, the principles of behaviour and scientific inquiry. As a, an applied behaviour analyst, you would focus on socially significant behaviour. So I guess, you know, when you're thinking about socially significant behaviour, you really want to focus on improvements that are most important for the individual and for, for those around the individual. So how do you promote the best learning conditions, let's say? Um, so an example of a socially significant behaviour would be where, let's say, an individual is maybe five or six, has a diagnosis of, of autism and is nonverbal providing that person with the skills to be able to communicate is an incredibly important and socially significant behaviour. So communication, the ability to communicate would be an important behaviour. Um, maybe in comparison to that, a, a behaviour which maybe would be, would be lower on the social significance end would be if, let's say, an individual is engaging in, in vocalisations and the vocalisations are not impacting their their learning or it's not impacting their ability to, to communicate or to learn, but it's a little bit irritating for their siblings. 
that wouldn't be something that we would signify as, as being high in terms of social significance. So it's really about identifying what the most important uh, targets are from a behavioural point of view for the individual. Related to that previous point then is um, where we would focus on meaningful improvement in important behaviour. So it's about identifying the important behaviour and then making sure that that behaviour is improving in a meaningful way. You know, if it's not improving in a meaningful way, how can we adapt the intervention to ensure that the behaviour improves meaningfully? And then everything we do is based on the analysis of the factors responsible for the improvement. So we will look at the contextual factors and the environmental factors that impact behaviour. So what's happening before the behaviour occurs? What's happening after the behaviour occurs? And how does that influence whether the behaviour will continue to occur in the future or whether it, it won't occur in the future? Um, so I guess I should, I mean, just sort of back to that previous point before I, I, I skip on to postgrad options in Ireland. So typically the kinds of, of um, people that behaviour analysts would work with, ABA, I suppose, very predominantly would work in the autism field. So working with autistic people of all ages. Um, and then also a lot of behaviour analysts would work in other areas like acquired brain injury. Um, myself, I focus on behavioural gerontology, so working with older adults. So the application of ABA can happen across a whole range of, of, um, of individuals and a, a whole range of settings. I, I will pick back up on that in, in a second. But first of all, I just want to talk to you a little bit about postgraduate options in Ireland. Um, so the options would be the MSc in ABA in NUIG or there's a postgrad diploma or an MSc in Trinity. Both of those are quite similar. They're both full time for two years and um, the entry requirements are slightly different where it's a 2-1 in psychology or related discipline for Trinity and a 2-2 in psychology or related discipline for NUIG. Um, both of them, you would have to attend class one day a week, although now with COVID, who knows what the, what the college environment will be like when all of this is, is done. Probably everybody will maybe take in some more blended learning, but typically it would be attendance at class in the college one day per week and then at the occasional weekend and then placement will be included for both of those. And um, then the other options are the MSc in ABA in Queens or the MSc in ABA in um, Coleraine. Um, Ulster, the, the, Coleraine, the Ulster University course in Coleraine would be quite similar to the NUIG and the, the Trinity courses as well in that it's two years, two one entry requirement in psychology or related discipline. And for each of those three courses as well, experience is considered. Um, so I'll talk about that in a moment, but it is a good idea to have experience in maybe an ABA setting when you're going in to apply for those programmes. Um, class attendance one day per week as well and placement isn't provided in the UU course but there's lots of links for placement and the placement would be approved by the course team and then for Queen's it's a one-year full-time or two-year part-time program and a lot of the, most of the Queen's program is online so it's mostly kind of blended learning for that so there's there's links you know I've links embedded to each of the courses in the, the slides there and obviously I'd be happy to share my slides with anybody who would who wants them and um, subsequently so you can you can look at those yourselves for more information anyway and just to note that two of those courses are currently being accredited by PSI so the NUIG course and the ABA course in Trinity both have um, accreditation applications in with PSI at the moment so they're undergoing accreditation so what to expect in your postgrad course then? So you would look at and learn about ABA definitions, characteristics of, of behaviour analysis and basic principles. Um, a lot of what you would do, a lot of what the important focus would be around looking at assessment and intervention. So looking at behavioural assessment, what are the factors that are influencing this behaviour occurring? You know, what are the conditions under which the behaviours occur? Whether it's sort of behaviours that you wish to, to reduce or behaviours that you wish to increase. So a lot of the focus, obviously, we want to focus more so on increasing appropriate, appropriate behaviours. And when the appropriate behaviours and the learning is increasing, sort of the inappropriate alternatives or the less appropriate just tend to, to reduce as, as a, a, a byproduct of that. And then a lot of the focus as well would be around behaviour and intervention. So writing up behaviour support plans, individualised education plans, and then evaluating all of that. So taking data to determine whether the interventions are effective, and if they're not, then how can they be changed or, or edited to, to make them more effective? 
because a large number of the people that we work with are um, individuals who are more vulnerable, professional and ethical practice is very important within ADA. So we have our own code of ethics and it's something that you need to continuously up update um, for continual professional development also. And it's a, it's a large part of the course just to work in, in ethical practice. Um, and then also typically with people who are on the postgraduate programmes will be working in the area as well. So typically people will go to their course one day a week and then they'll be working in some kind of an ABA setting. And that's just ideal because you're taking what you've learned in the classroom and you're applying it into your workplace. So it's really nice to be able to do that where, you know, you're learning something in the classroom on a Monday, let's say, and then on Tuesday to Friday, you get to go to work and you get to actually see it in practice. So you're moving, you're applying the skills that you've learned in one setting over to the other in, in real time. Um, certification after postgrad, this is actually a little bit complex right now because it's, it's sort of changing how this happens, but, but sort of up to this point and up until 2023, um, the BACB are offering offer certification. So this would be where an individual after their postgrad becomes eligible to sit the BCBA exam to, so to become a, a board certified behavior analyst. To do that, people would, would engage in up to 2000 hours of applied experience with 75 hours of those supervised by a, a supervisor who has their BCBA. So the, the postgrad courses will confer eligibility to sit this BCBA exam. So once you have your qualification and a certain number of classroom hours done, you're eligible to sit the exam. And then once qualified, you can recertify every two years. But the reason that this is a little bit complex right now is that since um, a, a while back, the BACB announced that candidates who don't reside in the US or Canada will no longer be able to become newly certified from 2023. So it just means that the landscape of how we have, because this was an international uh, certification and you could travel worldwide and it was a recognized qualification. So it was, it was, very, it was very good to have, you know, VACB are a, a US based, based um, certification board. So they've just decided to pull out of the rest of the world and just focus on the US and Canada. What this means for us as a division of behavior analysis, it just means that we have to work towards looking at an alternative for certification. We do think that certification is incredibly important so that, you know, after the, the postgraduate study, that people are engaging in enough experience to be able to then become qualified clinicians that they can be out working with people in an applied setting. And um, so there is a working group that's been set up to create a new behavior analytic organization within Ireland that would hopefully look after the certification. So certification is slightly different to accreditation, where accreditation is the accredited courses and the certification is like certifying uh, a person's um, suitability to practice. So we're in the process of setting up this Irish Society of, of Behaviour Analysis and we have 157 members on Slack so far. So things are moving in the right direction and hopefully for anybody who's listening to, to this call, by the time you guys would, would come out of postgrad, we'll have all of this sorted. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> Um, but I just wanted to mention that in case anybody did come across the BACB and, and wonder what their role was. So different um, career or different experiences, I'm keeping an eye on the time here on my phone, so um, prompt me, uh, Ruth, if I need to stop talking, but I only have two slides left anyway. So work experience and career progression, what people can do is they would generally get experience in places like PALS um, Preschool, Abacus in Kilimana or Kabarak, the ABA Preschool Academy, the Red Door, the Agency, Stepping Stones. So each of these places will have, have opportunities for individuals after your undergraduate degree. So after your undergraduate degree, you can apply for a teaching council number and, and work as an ABA tutor in places like these. Under supervision, you can get support to run home programs as well. So you can work with individuals um, in, their, in their homes. Um, so people would have home tuition funding granted to them where they can't get a place in the school. And, you know, typically that would be for somebody with intellectual or developmental disabilities. If people want to know more about that, do have a look at the ABA Ireland Facebook page. Um, and it's, it's just a page where there's both ABA clinicians and, and families who use ABA services there. So it's a really interesting and good support page. Um, so just a, a case example, so my experience of progressing to my career in ABA, I did my undergrad degree in psychology and then I was employed as an ABA tutor in Abacus and Kilnamana. 
while I was in Abacus, so that was working with people with, uh, with autistic people from age four to 18. And while I was there, I completed my doctorate in ABA. I got my BCBA qualification. And then at that point, the decision was, do you go down the applied route or do you go down the academic route? For me, I wanted to do the academic route. So I did a postdoc in the Institute of Neuroscience, which then shifted my focus from autism over to dementia and to healthy aging. So I, I now apply my, my ABA skills to a different area. Um, and then I went on to do my lectureships. And, you know, I, I do ABA research. I provide clinical supervision to people who are pursuing their careers in ABA. And I, I supervise students as well. But for people who would go down the, the applied route, you know, there are so many different opportunities for individuals. And there's a real demand for these kinds of careers as well. You know, all of the, the postgraduate students that, that we would see coming out would be, would be employed in these kinds of services. So in education and behavior support services, mental health, community living services. And then additionally, what people, sometimes people would do would be to go through the ABA courses in order to prepare themselves for clinical or educational. So the, the, kind, of, um, the kind of work and the kind of topics that we focus on within ABA are very, closely aligned to the kinds of skills that you would need for clinical or educational in terms of behavioral intervention and assessment. So it does provide an excellent foundation or preparation for that further career, further study, if people wanted to go down that route. Um, and then also, you know, people wanted to do private work, behavioral interventions, and then the opportunities abroad are fantastic as well. So the New England Center for Children in Boston hires graduates from Ireland really often you know you go to london abu dhabi and um, just as another case example myself and my sister did our doctorate together and i went to the academic route she moved to the states and she's now director of a, a service provision a company that provides services for people with autism and she probably earns twice what i do so the wages in the us are really good for people who have qualifications in ABA as well. And the qualifications in Ireland seem to be looked very favorably upon in the US as well. Okay, so hopefully I didn't go too far over time. Um, so that's the contact details. That's the, the behavior analysis at psychologicalsociety.ie is our division contact. And then that's my email address, michelle.kelly at ncirl.ie as well. So please do contact either for further queries and we would be happy to have anybody, you know, join our, our division for membership also. So thanks a million. And I'll pass over to Ruth there. If anybody has any questions, I presume the same, Ruth, I, I can answer them in the chat. You can. There's, a, there's a, two 